Hi, I'm Neil. This chapter is all about measurement and the equations of motion. Now, to describe motion, you make some sort of physical measurement. All measurements um, need a reference. For example, if I were to tell you that this ball, my prop, was on this table right here at a certain height you know, above the floor of the room and located somewhere from the entrance to this room. And if I were to tell you, uh, please come in and retrieve this ball from on top of this desk, uh, I would have to give you some specific information. If I simply told you to come on in and make 10 steps straight ahead, five steps to the right, chances are not everyone will end up where the ball is located. Well, that's for many reasons. You assumed I told you that you're walking into the room facing forward, not sideways. Um, and besides that, you know, depending on your height, each person has a different step size, some larger than others. A taller person may have a larger step and a not so tall person a smaller step. So I would have to be very specific about an origin. So we all start at the same point, same entrance to the room. And I would have to be very specific about the unit of measurement, my step size, maybe one foot. So then I can finally tell you that we're going to use an entrance, the same entrance to the room, facing forward, take 10 steps straight ahead and five steps to the right, where each step is measured as one foot. Then and only then will every single person end up where the ball is located. Now, this chapter, uh, we define many things um, in terms of measurement. Uh, Measurements are based on some kind of physical phenomena or physical quantity, whether it be the heat, uh, temperature, uh, volume, pressure, distance, mass, weight, example. They're all referenced to something else. For example, I can show you here on my monitor. This item right here, it's a cylinder. It's made of platinum and iridium. Uh, it's actually housed at the Bureau of International Standards in Paris. It's exactly 3.9 centimeters in height and 3.9 centimeters in diameter. This is a standard that the world uses for one kilogram. So everything else uh, is referenced to the mass of the cylinder. So this is quite literally our physical reference for mass. Okay. Now, as we continue uh, throughout this chapter, let me get the chapter once again. As we go through this chapter, you'll find the definitions of all of the other parameters of measurement and their origins. For example, uh, the time that we refer to as one second is referenced to a specific radioactive isotope of cesium. Nine plus billion, that is a very specific number, uh, over 9 billion particles, radioactive particles, that are ejected. The duration of uh, the time required uh, for this to happen is what the world defines as one second, and everything else is referenced from that one second. So that's another example of a physical um, phenomenon or property. So as we go through this chapter, we're going to define things such as vectors and the components of vectors. Now to do that, if I were to get a different diagram, take a look at this. So all quantities, make it a bit larger. There we go. All right. So all physical quantities um, fall into one of two categories, either a scalar or a vector. And quite simply, a scalar uh, is a measurement that has size or magnitude only. For example, uh, the speedometer of your car measures a scalar quantity, how fast you're going. It says nothing about the direction in which you're going. However, if you were to say to someone that you're traveling at 60 miles per hour due north, now you've added direction part to the magnitude part. So magnitude plus direction gives you a vector. Okay. So we represent a vector by a line with an arrow like this, and each vector can be broken down into two components. If it's a two-dimensional vector, there are three-dimensional vectors as well, which we'll get to later on. But for a simple two-dimensional vector, it can be broken down into its x component and into its y component, the vertical part. 
And so all vectors can be treated the same way. Now vectors are a bit tricky to handle. Uh, they can be added and multiplied, etc. Um, but there are some rules to follow. And in this chapter, we will discuss, if we get the chapter back up, in this chapter, we will discuss uh, all of the properties of vectors and scalars, uh, in particular vectors, and how we go about uh, handling three-dimensional components, as this diagram here indicates. Uh, we'll talk about the cross product, the dot product, and the different uses of the multiplication of vectors, and you know, everything is described from uh, basic definitions and first principles, so it leaves nothing to chance for the reader. Uh, and there are many examples as we go along, and here you can see that we begin defining velocity and acceleration, and from that we use a bit of uh, integral calculus, and we can derive the basic equations of motion, linear motion that is. Circular motion is a different story. We'll get to that later on in a different chapter. So there are several equations of motion that we will uh, derive and we will use these derivations of the equations in many examples. For example, this is uh, on one of my trips. Uh, <clears throat> this is in uh, Pisa, Italy. This is the world famous Leaning Tower of Pisa. So I use these physical examples <clears throat> of, for example, launching something or dropping something off the Leaning Tower of Pisa. How much time would you have to get out of the way, for example? So we consider all of these uh, <clears throat> uh, physical examples in our derivation of linear motion and two-dimensional motion. That is, if I were to uh, take this ball right here and move it along this way, that's linear motion. It's relatively simple to explain and describe using our equations that we derive. But if we add a second component, what if this ball is launched with some initial velocity at some angle to the horizontal, like this? Uh, this now describes projectile motion, where once the object, in this case the ball, it leaves, then gravity uh, is pulling on the ball. So its X component of its horizontal motion stays the same because gravity acts vertically. So as the ball is moving like this, gravity is pulling on the vertical component of the ball and parabolic or curved motion ensues. This is what we call projectile motion. And as you can see in the diagram here, projectile motion is described in great detail and we work on several examples of projectile motion. Um, as we scroll down, all kinds of things are derived. Uh, here is uh, Southern Norway, Lisa Fjord, Pulpit Rock. And we will work on an example of launching a golf ball um, on one of my trips here. Uh, there's actually a guy standing on the top of Pulpit Rock, which is thousands of feet high, uh, launching a golf ball uh, as a projectile into these waters here. These waters, by the way, are, well, they were home to uh, the Vikings a thousand years ago. So there's a lot of history here at uh, Pulpit Rock in Lisa Fjord, Norway. And so we describe some uh, several examples of motion uh, <clears throat> from pulpit rock. Um, we calculate such things as the time of flight, the time taken to get to the maximum height. Uh, what is the maximum height? How do we calculate such a thing? Uh, the maximum horizontal range, that is the distance traveled um, linearly. And we also talk about, this is in um, the jungle of Costa Rica. This is me doing some rappelling, jumping off from some cliffs over here. And this is a form of projectile motion, or at least we can make some amendments to the scenario. And we do just that. Uh, as I launch off of a cliff over here, well, about 300 feet high, we derive some examples uh, of projectile motion. And we solve for all of these uh, parameters. Now, now there are many examples to consider, and uh, at the very end of this chapter, there are some additional word problems to consider uh, of this projectile motion. So at the end of this chapter, the reader should have a very good handle on the derivation of linear equations, how to describe motion in a straight line, and how we can use these very same equations uh, to uh, predict uh, the behavior of objects you know, not moving in a straight line, acted on by gravity, that is projectile motion. So it's a complete chapter and there are uh, significant details uh, 
uh, it, you know, it will take a significant amount of time to go over all of this, uh, which we can't in this video. This video is just meant as an introduction to uh, the content of this chapter. But I hope the reader finds it very useful uh, and very helpful in understanding how the applications are made to everyday life uh, and everyday situations uh, of objects moving, either in a straight line or in multiple dimensions. All right, thank you.